I wanted to just quickly start by uh, telling you a little story. Um, back a couple of years ago, anyone here Oakland Raiders fan? Nice. I'm, I'm so sorry for you too. Um, no, I'm not an Oakland Raiders fan either. I actually am the most pathetic of football fans. I'm a New York Jets fan. Which means I've got about another 14 years before the, uh, the contract with Joe Namath Joe Nam gave him the devil. So they could win the Super Bowl three expires before we have a winning season. But a few years ago, a friend of mine came and actually uh, had Raiders playoff tickets. If you can remember that there actually was a time when the Raiders were in the playoffs. Uh, and he said, why don't you come with me? It's in, it's in the Coliseum, and we're in the black hole. You familiar with the black hole? You're not familiar with the black hole? You know those pictures of the Raiders fans where everyone's wearing face paint and has machetes and guns? <laughs> That's the black hole. Yeah, see, he knows. So here I am, a Jets fan, going to, going to stay in the black hole for a playoff game. And so what he did was he gave me a Brent Bolitnikoff jersey in the future. I don't know who Bolitnikov was, he was a famous wide receiver for the for Oakland. And so I got there and everyone thought I was the greatest. They, they thought it was really terrific and they were high-fiving me when the Raiders did something great. And, you know, the Raiders would do something terrible and secretly inside I was cheering. But outside, uh, I you know, put on my sad face and everyone was consoling me. And they were, it turns out they're all really great guys as long as you're wearing Oakland uh, Raiders jerseys. So the reason that I tell you this story is that Lou Cerny was supposed to be here today. And Lou, unfortunately, is, is deathly ill, uh, as evidenced by this email that I'm going to put up here uh, that just sent me. Let's see if I can actually get it to show him. It's a little hard to, hard to do that on here. So Lou sent me an email and said, thanks for subbing in for me. Heinz Luke is getting stuck with rock and roll lullaby at the last minute. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> <laughs> so Lou, Lou is the founder of New Relic and, uh, and is very smart technically. And he has sent me to you, not the founder of New Relic, and not particularly smart technically. So uh, I, I, my name is Bill Claps and I'm the Vice President of Business Development for, for New Relic. So, Anyway, with that apology in advance, I'm going to take you through some of what New Relic can do, what RPM can do, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we use New Relic on New Relic uh, to make sure that it's really highly performing, because it is a giant Rails app, and it does get a lot of data sent to it all the time, and uh, we try and keep it coming. And so we use this tool, we have our own uh, to, to manage our production servers. Uh, has anyone here, in fact, I know some people will raise their hand, has anyone here ever used RPM? A bunch of people. Cool. Uh, for those of you who, uh, who don't know, a little background, New Relic is a company that's founded on, based on the premise that having a, having a web application that actually performs and having a Rails application that actually scales is a really good thing. And that you need tools to be able to make that so, uh, to be able to make that happen. And so, I'll go back to my presentation here. And so we created uh, RPM. Uh, RPM is, stands for Rails Performance Management, and it is a production performance monitoring tool for, for Rails. And like I said, we use this extensively. So we have a staging environment that we throw all our new code into, and uh, we watch as the staging environment crashes here and there and we fix things. But even more importantly, once, yeah, once things pass the staging environment, we, we deploy into production. And it turns out, you know, I came from the Java world originally and we deployed into production maybe, I don't know, every six months, every nine months, if you're selling a packaged application, you'd, you'd give it to a bank and the bank would go off and they would deploy it in their one window a year where they were allowed to put new code into production. So let me take a, a, just a quick show of hands. How many people deploy to production once a month? At least, at least once a month. Okay, I was, I was shocked by the people who did that. How many deploy to production once a week? How about once a day? How about once an hour? <laughs> really? 
How about you're constantly deploying production? <laughs> we do have, we do have, listen, we do have customers that are deploying five, six times a day production. It turns out deploying production and, and monitoring that production running application is really critical. And getting getting information back to your developers is really critical so that your developers can quickly fix bugs when they come up. Because once something's in deployment, that's when your customers are, are going to get affected with the performance, uh, performance issue. So bonus points to whoever can, uh, aside from you, because you know, uh, whoever can uh, tell me where that quote came from. It is a song. Who wrote it? And I, I'll give you a clue. It's not El Barge. That's Rockwell. Rockwell, somebody's watching. Bonus points. So, uh, monitoring, uh, monitoring production app is important. Turns out that a lot of people in Rails are using monitoring tools uh, to monitor a production app. In fact, there's a recent Rails posting survey uh, that you may have seen that basically said right around 50% of all people in the survey, and I think there were 1,500 respondents, uh, that deploy an app in production actually use tools to monitor it in production, which is pretty cool because it's not always obvious that your testing and everything else ahead of time will catch every, you know, won't catch every single problem. Uh, a lot of our customers use RPM for one particular purpose, and that is when when there's a problem, how do you know who needs to fix the problem? How do you know if it's a database problem? If the problem is affecting all your customers, some of your customers, none of your customers, is it an important problem? Is it not an important problem? And Overall, how's your performance of your application meeting your expectations of how well your application should be? So we focus on analyzing the app tier of your application, right? The Rails stack, your code, module, thing, passenger, etc. Uh, which is good because, especially for those who are deploying in, in the cloud, knowing how well the router is working or how well the actual server is working. It's not something that you necessarily have control of. So the way we look at things is see how the app is performing and see how the app is using all the other resources around it, like the database. So don't put monitoring in the database itself. At least we're not doing that. There are great monitoring tools for MySQL and for all the other uh, databases that are out there. But instead, how's my app using the database? What queries is it making? How are those queries being affected? Uh, especially when I roll out the direction. Bottom line is that there are a lot better tools out there. This is one of them. And there are others. And there are better tools than winging your log files after the fact. Because everybody loves to do that, right? <laughs> yeah, that's the oldest Rails joke in the book. <laughs> so, I'm going to, before we get to error detection, I'm going to show you RPM. So what you're seeing now is New Relic RPM monitoring New Relic RPM, our production servers. This is our staging site, and I'm going to be using the staging site for the, for the demo here. And uh, so let me see if I, can, if I can do this. It's a little unintuitive because it's not up on my screen here. Uh, to give you an idea of the scope of New Relic RPM, we have about 1,500 customers that are constantly sending us data. Uh, using RPM to monitor their own applications, their own Rails apps. And that's all collected by what we call our collector tier here, which is, which is App Engine Yard. It's on our cluster, and it's, uh, it's eight posts or slices at Engine Yard, and it's running 24 total modules. So it's three modules per, per slice. And you can see some basic statistics on our dashboard page, uh, but the most interesting one is here, and this is on a uh, you know, this is on a Saturday, and we're getting 19,134 requests per minute. What that means is that there are 19,000 agents out there sending a, sending a little packet of information back to us every minute that we're then capturing in our collective here and writing to our database and letting you uh, access through our, through our UI tier, which is, which is here. And we're doing that on average with a 38 millisecond response time. So for those people who are new to Rails here, and I think that there may be some people, Rails absolutely can scale. 
uh, I think we can, we can show it. I, I know a number of other people here can show it too. Um, in any case, so with, with that volume of data, performance is really critical because we, we need to be able to collect and manage all that data and then give you access to it. So let's go into the collector's view. This is going to give you a short overview of the product because I think a lot of people don't know it. Um, the first place you get to is sort of an overview page and you get a bunch of statistics like uh, response time and throughput, your active record, something called AppDex, and just a quick word on AppDex. Does anybody know what AppDex is? Aside from Wolf, who should know. Nope? Okay, one person. Well, AppDex is a systems management standard that's been out there for a couple of years. Um, and what we found was it's a really interesting metric for us. Um, here's what it does. It allows you to find one number of response time. And it says, this is a satisfactory response time for users of my application. And, it, and what that does is it allows you to then say, so what's a tolerating, a tolerable uh, response time, which is less than satisfactory, and a frustrating one. And then it gives you, uh, it gives you a, a score of one if all your transactions are, are uh, above satisfactory. And it takes points away from you as you, as you go down. And what it, lets you allow, what it allows you to do is compare apples to apples, application to application, and also gives you a good, uh, if you have a business guy like me, and the business guy comes and says, the app is slow, and you say, oh, well, it has a 35, you know, 35 millisecond response time. And the guy says, I know, see how slow it is? Well, this gives you a way to say, no, it's, uh, we set an SLA, and we set a, a, a number that says 35 milliseconds is satisfactory response time. And so I'm, I'm achieving that. Um, the other things on this page that we're showing is some error information, um, CPU utilization, physical memory uh, utilization. And then we have these lines here which indicate performance. So for us, uh, we deploy, I can barely read that. Uh, but we, we deployed uh, right at that time, correct? And you can do things like change the viewing window, of course, et cetera. Uh, but I'm going to take you into errors. One of the things that we find is uh, really critical for our developers when we make a new deployment is watching the rate of errors and seeing what types of errors are happening uh, immediately following those deployments. Uh, because they are often an indication of, of problems in code that, that made it into the production environment. And so what, you, what you're seeing here is uh, the last 24 hours of errors and the error rate. And it's actually, uh, it's actually pretty good. It's, we're averaging about four errors per minute on, on our application, on our collector tier. And then what we've done is we've come down here and we've, uh, we've aggregated uh, the errors over this seven day, uh, sorry, 24 hour time period. And uh, so we have a customer who will go nameless, but the way before they were using uh, RPM, the way they were handling error detection was they had uh, an email go every, to their inbox every single time uh, an error happened. And they were getting so many errors that all they did was they watched the, the inbox count and they watched the rate at which it was in, uh, increasing. <laughs> and if it was increasing really fast, they, they got their act together and did something about it. But if it was you know slow, it was okay. <laughs> So, yeah, it's not. <laughs> it needs a paper bag, I think. Um, so, what this helps you do, in addition to aggregating errors, is if you wanted to see more information about a particular type of error, so you can go in here. And it shows you the rail stack, it gives you more information about what's going on with that particular error. Uh, and then you can also look and see similar errors. You can share this error, uh, send it as, a, as an email to other people on your team. And then what often happens with errors is you want to open a ticket. So if anyone uses Lighthouse, we have an integration with Lighthouse that will automatically open a ticket and append all this information into your light, into Lighthouse for you. Sorry to be flipping back and forth. I, I wrapped my brain for an easy way to do this if there wasn't one. So uh, another really interesting thing that, uh, that our developers spend a lot of time looking at is transactions and individual transactions in particular. The dashboard that you saw earlier is all aggregate information. The traffic lights are all aggregate information, and that usually tells a pretty good story. And if, a, if in aggregate your application is performing poorly, you need to do something about it. But many times you'll find that applications are performing really well in aggregate, and yet you have customers complaining. 
you have certain types of transactions or certain uh, individual customers who are experiencing really slow transactions. Um, and that's represented by the penguin, of course, seeing that it's gotta be me. In general, everybody's the same individually. Things can be wildly out of whack. Did I make it back to that? Yes. So let's look at, uh, at some transactions here. And take a second, I'm on this air card because I can't get our net right here to work. <laughs>
uh, in terms of each individual transaction. But it's here that if we had something that was taking a long time, we see this all the time where somebody um, misindexed a query or has really bad like uh, join query or something like that. I mean, it, it, these, these things can take very long. You can find that you would be able to click on milliseconds and uh, and see. Oh, here's one. 659 milliseconds. So we click on that, and what it does it goes in the uh, gets gets you the explain form. Again, this is all in production. Uh, so next is deployments. I guess I really didn't have that slide for that guy. So let's go back and look at Toby's deployments. We find that deployments are, again, I said this before, it's one of the most critical uh, critical pieces to uh, keeping your application running. It's, it's the time in a developer's life, at least I've been told by our development team, for our app, uh, that's the most risky. You're introducing something new, and they're really not sure how it's going to happen. And so what we try and do is, for every deployment, we want to do the on it. And then we'll capture data uh, from an hour before through three hours afterwards and give you an idea of what's happened with that particular deployment. And so in this case, you know, Tony's been doing this for a while with us, and here are all his deployments since late February. And we can see, uh, you know, he had some that were good and some that weren't so good, but uh, in general, you know, it looks like he's using a little more CPU these days, but a little less memory. He's probably doing some optimization. And then, you know, you can go in here and actually look at the detail of each of these deployments. So, you know, here's, here's his license key, so copy that thing. Uh, you get a handle on what's going on with the deployment. Right, so again, time before and time after. Now, I'm going to risk going back to our staging environment because I think it's particularly interesting. When you look at our deployments. We will have collector queue. We go to our deployments. That was a bad deployment. Did you see that? I don't know if you caught the errors. But you can see it here. We went from 0.2 errors per minute to 3.1 errors per minute on that deployment. What I wanted to just show you is, an, is a way of tracking kind of how your application is improving over time. If you look here back in December, we had a, a group of about 15,000 requests per minute. So we're at least 25% more requests per minute now than we were then. Uh, and the CPU burn was about 65%, and we were using 373 megabytes of memory. You come up here, we're using about the same amount of memory, about the same CPU burn, it's about the same response time, but now, but now we're doing 25% more improvement. And we can track from deployment to deployment to see how that, how that took place. I'm going to move right along because I'm going to run out of time. We just, I'm not going to show this to you because I'm running out of time, but we do some really nice scalability analysis that plots all your throughput versus, uh, versus, uh, well, maybe I'll just show it to you. Very quick one. Scalability analysis, graphs. So, for the last seven days, how's our database? How's our database going? So here's our, interesting. So here's our uh, throughput at the bottom and response time, rather than response, rather than uh, over time, we're plotting throughput versus response time. And it's not exactly the graph that you want to see. You want to see a nice horizontal line. See what response time looks like. Yeah. So this this is an indication that either maybe we don't have enough data at the low at the low throughputs, or. Uh, or there's something we can do to optimize our database at that point. 
So mm -hmm. out of our data, out of our uh, developers use RPM in particular. Well, they use what well, we they use notes, and they're constantly using uh, they're constantly looking at the application, and then they're collecting the data and they're passing it around to each other. So when the, when there are particular problems, I'm just going to take you through one of the problems that we had the other day. Uh, they're taking advantage of all these things that I showed you. Uh, so we had a problem the other day. Uh, we had uh, one of our customers created a really great widget for uh, for Mac OS X that puts in your status bar, puts a little green traffic light that you can uh, click on and it shows you your entire dashboard information. You don't even have to log into our RPM anymore. We used our, our data API. And really the first time somebody had done something really fantastic with our data API. Uh, what we found though was uh, that we had some interesting, uh, some interesting problems happening on our staging site when all the relevant employees installed this particular widget. Um, the way that we isolated it, uh, I'll take you through, because we created a note for it. So you see there's a note called staging slowdown. So any, any graph that you have in your relic has a little button on it that says add the note. And then you can append more and more graphs and annotate them. And so here's what we saw. Uh, Lou noticed that, that our staging environment was getting a lot worse on 31st of March around noon. And you can pretty clearly see where that was happening. This is our Aptex, again, our Aptex uh, score that I talked to you before. And you can see that what's happening here is the number of, of transactions that were less than satisfactory, in this case, tolerable, jumped dramatically. So something was going on. Uh, and that was his first indication that there was a problem in our production site. So next he went and he said, OK, well, this looks interesting. With each of these deployments, things are getting worse. And so his, his suspicion was that this particular deployment uh, done by Bill Kaiser, not, not me, I don't touch the product, uh, what, had introduced something that was causing a problem. And in fact, when we went down here, there's more, uh, more uh, corroborating evidence. Uh, the yellow line here is throughput. And so when you look at this deployment and you look at the response time going up, while load is staying basically the same, that's another indication of, of, some, of some kind of problem. So then, then you start to wonder, if we, is, is a page taking too long? Is a controller faulty? You know, what, was, what was going on? Well, we then noticed that as soon as that deployment happened, the database response time started spiking. So something was hitting the database a lot more than it had been, or causing extremely long queries to happen. And so finally, uh, the development team, within not, not too long, let's see, it was 11.45, and the problem was first noticed at uh, 11.40. So here's five minutes after, after the problem was noticed. Using these graphs, uh, they found the problem. And it turns out that uh, the accounts controller index uh, which is a REST call that feeds that traffic light widget that I talked about, uh, was getting hit like every 15 seconds for every widget that was out there. <laughs> and it was a real, yeah, exactly, it was a real problem. So uh, we all shut down our widgets, and pretty instantly you can see, uh, once we turned off that API access to that widget, you know, response time dropped to almost uh, not noticeable uh, levels. And we did that with another So here's an example of one of our developers, in this case our founder, looking at the data that we're surfacing in a production environment uh, and sending it then. What he did was he said, share the node. And this side, I'm going to use on the account. And then you can send that note with all the data associated with it uh, to everyone on the team. And now you have some real actionable information about what you need to go and switch and, and fix in your development environment so that you can quickly do a new deploy. Um, and you can see within five minutes, that's exactly what happened. We found a problem happening, isolated the problem, made that quick determination of what the problem was, fixed the problem, deployed, and then everything was back. So we think this is a pretty cool tool. We have about 1,500 customers, as I said, who are think it's a pretty cool tool as well. Uh, and for those of you who are not using it, we do even have a free version out there called RPM Lite uh, that can get you started. Oh, and one more thing. 
A lot of the features are, that I was showing you were kind of higher end features. And if you'd like to try those out, uh, we have a promotion code for this group. It's, it's LA Rudy. Do copy that now. You go to our site and sign up for our PM Light, which is free, and type in that, uh, that promotion code. You'll get 30 days of the gold service to try out. Uh, to try all these features and see if they, if they work for you. So uh, with that, any questions? Yes? Where do your users hang out? I'm sorry? Where do your users hang out? Where do our users hang out? Yeah, do you have a community? Um, well, we have a couple of things that, 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 that are interesting since you mentioned that. We have a support forum. We hope users don't have to hang out there. But, it's, but it is a really great source of information, you know, when you're reporting things. Um, the other thing, yes, my time is done. So the other thing that we have is uh, we, we sponsor a uh, website called Rails Lab, uh, railslab.com, and on it you'll find a lot of uh, podcasts and videos uh, done part by us, part by uh, Greg Pollock at Rails Envy, uh, some from NGR, some from other sources, uh, one of our affiliates. Um, Wolf Arnold did a couple on, on team building for, for uh, scalable applications. It's a, just a wealth of really cool information. It's all free, there's no registration. Uh, and lots of people are hanging out on that site, uh, site too, to, to learn more about, in general, how does Rails scale, how do you make your app scale? Um, because it's, to the best, it's, for, it's good for all of us if everybody knows how to make really highly performing Rails applications. Yes? If you're already uh, using RPM, will we we'll use that code to upgrade? Yeah, absolutely. So if you already have an account for RPM, and you go into your Accounts tab, right, and you click on Change Subscription, then there's a promo code box at the top. Don't change anything else, just put in the promo code, press a button, and you'll be upgraded to your gold trial for 30 days. And then after that, it, uh, it'll just revert to your previous subscription. Yes? Did you say that site was Rails Live? Rails Lab, R-A-I-L-S-L-A-B.com. Yes. Okay, what do I do on the first? Oh, uh, for our PM? So we have four price levels. Uh, there's light, bronze, silver, and gold. Light is free across unlimited numbers of posts for as long as you want. Uh, bronze starts at $40 per post per month. Silver is 85 per post per month, and gold is 200 per post per month. Uh, we have volume pricing, and for anyone who's deployed in sort of a cloud environment, especially if you're e-commerce and you have a lot of uh, scaling up and scaling down, we actually also have uh, some use space pricing uh, that if you, if you contact us, we can walk through. Uh, I should mention, too, that the difference between those product categories, light gives you a 30-minute window, can't, there's not a lot of historical reporting of light. Uh, bronze, seven days of data storage. Uh, silver is a month, and then gold is three months of data storage. And then we layer in some of these advanced features like transaction tracing and, and uh, the deep dive in the deployments. Everything shows you the line where you deploy. Everything has the notes capability. Everything has the integration campfire uh, and lighthouse. Uh, Things like the scalability analysis are, are top level features. Yes? Do you find an extending this approach beyond Rails or other rack apps? Basically, like your app rack middleware? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, for example, we're having some discussions with our friends at Heroku on doing stuff like that. So we're, we're always looking at that. There are any, you know, the, the technology here is all Rails. We're 100% Rails app. but. This could monitor anything with a, with a decent enough framework to be able to know what we need to call the various bits and pieces of information. So right now we're focused uh, just on the, rail, on the rail stack, but who knows in the future. Yes? Uh, do you have support for Ruby and uh... I have no idea. Uh, but if you go to newrelic.tenderapp.com and ask that question there, uh, you'll get the answer for sure. Other questions? Yes? What do you generate the cool graphs with? <laughs> <laughs> you like the graphs. You know, it's interesting, and I'll, I'll tell you this in a second what we're using. But uh, when we first launched this, we, this product uh, was 
launched at Rails Conference last year, so it's not yet a year old. Uh, pretty, a lot of development has gone into this in just a very short period of time. With a very small team, I think we have four developers. Um, but uh, the thing that caught people's eyes at, at RailsConf last year were the graphs, and particularly the spinning graphs, where the pie charts spin in. I love those. Uh, but it's a charting package called uh, Fusion Charts. And it's, you, can, you can go and license it. Uh, it's not very expensive. That's really cool. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? No, other hands. Okay, thank you very much uh, for letting me substitute for Lou, and uh, I hope this was valuable. It was a lot of fun.